So thank you. Please keep him in your thoughts. And now I'm going to hand this over to Lauren Michalakis, who's going to kick off this session. Thank you. So, so my job right now is really just to set the stage for, the, for this. We're, again, coming, coming back down to earth from, from spiritual issues and probably the reason why most of us got pulled into this work is to sort of explore our own spiritual domains and intermix them with the spiritual domains of our patients. But we're back into the real world in something called opioid prescribing. So, um, and I'm really excited to have this presentation. I think this is really an important presentation to have. Um, and again, just to provide some context for maybe some of us in the room who don't prescribe. So pain and symptom management is an important component of palliative care, of course. Opioid prescribing is probably one of the most, one of the most, not the most, one of the most important contributions that medical providers deliver to patients struggling with various pain sy syndromes and, and dyspnea. Uh, but as we, uh, we all know, opioids are a double-edged sword. Opioids are probably the most effective way to manage severe pain, yet um, they also present a real clear and present danger, not just to the individual receiving the opioid, but also to surrounding family members, community members, and society as a whole, as, we've, as we have um, come to understand. We have a, an opioid crisis. Right? People are dying every day. And although most of the opioid deaths, as we know it, um, are due to heroin mixed with fentanyl these days, um, we're told that as many as 25% of overdoses can be traced to the prescription, to the pres uh, prescribing of a legally obtained opioid. So I think that, you know, again, most palliative care clinicians are, they recognize the risks, participate in safe, responsible, and effective prescribing, but we're also increasingly aware that our prescribing patterns um, need to follow accepted standards and follow the requirements put into effect by our own law, LD 1646, which started in um, 2016, which limited the amount of um, opioids that people could be prescribed and limited the number of days. Now, we in palliative care, we were kind of, we are, we are, we think, we're exempt there's a, there's a hospice exemption, a palliative care exemption, a cancer exemption. So, you know, we have been sort of in this place where we have been feeling that we understand, you know, our responsibilities within the context of this law. But the reality is, is that uh, palliative care providers prescribe in a very tension-filled environment. So safe, comfortable patients on one side and addiction, overdose, and premature deaths on the other. So, uh, you know, I think it's just really responsible of this community of prescribers to be aware. I attended um, the uh, governor's summit on, opioid, um, on, on opioids and the opioid crisis in June of this year. It was the first time I had heard about it. I think I had seen it in the paper about the Justice Department's criminal division establishing something called the New England Prescription Opioid Strike Force, something called NAPO, um, which is directed towards a serious, a serious initiative to sort of find those prescribers who might be prescribing illegally um, or without a sense of responsibility. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are three of those states within NAPO. Um, so it should not uh, surprise any of us that um, many of those physicians who today are being identified as those high prescribers um, might be in this room, might be among palliative care clinicians. Again, we are practicing within the limits of our of our expertise within exemption A or B, um, but um, or C, Oops, I forgot. <laughs> but um, I think it's just really, really important to be aware that this is happening, and for us to do a, a quick check of ourselves to make sure that we are behaving and prescribing in the most responsible way, so that a our patients can be safe and comfortable and our communities can also be safe. So I'm so glad that we have this, this discussion to have today. Um, and you've already met Jim. Jim will be our second speaker. And with us today also we have Dr. Elizabeth Mock, who is a, um, an addiction specialist who um, um, also is contracted with the Maine Prescription Monitoring Program um, through the Office of Be Behavioral Health in the state of Maine. So I think you're going to kick it off. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
So that was like somewhat sombering. And I don't have any relationship with the law enforcement side. But I can just tell you from a data monitoring side and give you some advice about sort of best practices and universal precautions to try to help uh, alleviate some of the tension that people might feel. Uh, law enforcement is looking for pill mills. And uh, I, I personally don't think there are a lot of pill mills in the state of Maine. But people who are out on the edges of prescribing guidelines, uh, maybe they need to pay attention to the universal precautions. So here we go. Um, I'm a family physician by training, so that's kind of my heart, the whole person, comprehensive care. But I've moved into other areas, so I don't actually work in family medicine. And I have a few friends in here who are the same way, right? We've, we've had a, a circuitous uh, trajectory to our careers. And um, this is the PMP mission. So it, it's to promote public health and welfare. So just like the licensing boards, we're supposed to be there uh, to look at things in the background and, and see if we can identify problems be before they come, become bigger problems. And, um, and to detect and prevent substance use disorder, that's a tall order that looking at data could prevent substance use disorder. But we do know that people with chronic pain, and we'll talk about is we have a chronic pain here, and then we have palliative care here, and sometimes they intertwine. People with chronic pain who are chronically prescribed high-dose opioids for long periods of time do have a risk of developing an opioid use disorder. So trying to think where where is the, the pendulum is swinging and, and where are we? Um, so here I don't take any money from anyone. Um, and I'm an independent contractor. So there's all the disclosures obligatory. And then so I'll talk about stand, uh, universal precautions. I'll talk about some of the things that we're doing in the PMP right now. So you can be sort of like uh, first to know. And then Jim is going to talk about this really complicated intersection of complex palliative care and responsible opioid prescribing. And there may not be right answers to some of the cases that he's going to present. And we can just try to figure out what are the best practices. Um, so here's the universal precautions. You've probably all heard this before, right? And we'll talk about some of the exemptions for hospice and palliative care. But in general, the things that we should all be doing are good practices, like having an informed consent or patient provider agreement, um, especially if you think treatment is going to go on for any length of time. That's good to have. I call with my patients, I work in a buprenorphine clinic, I call it the rules with the patient. And I say, this is what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. This is how we're going to work together. These are the situations where um, like certain things can come up, and, and we all want to be on the same page. Um, check the PMP. I'll talk about the exemption. Um, checking the PMP is never wrong, even when you don't have to. If you do, it's always a good thing. And I'll talk about some of the looks at that. Um, if someone is on chronically medications by, by law, by Chapter 21 from the Joint Board Rules, you're required to do a urine once a year. So if you have someone that you've been prescribing for for five years, there might be looked at more as a chronic pain situation than a hospice palliative care situation. If it's been five years, they really need a urine toxicology once a year if, if it's been a very long-term prescribing situation. Um, and then some of these only apply to sort of your standard chronic pain that you think of, lower back pain, fibromyalgia, migraine headaches. You want to talk about functional improvement, think about random counts, um, looking at alternatives, um, making sure that people are connected with behavioral health, because we know that um, there's a lot of um, intersection between behavioral health and chronic pain, and people who are tapering off opioids to uh, try to live their lives without opioids for many decades not necessarily your patients, but for them, behavioral health support and cognitive behavioral therapy is a keystone of them getting off these chronic medications. Um, seeing patients regularly, I, I think that that probably happens. But if you're in a situation where you're writing an opioid script every month and you haven't seen someone for six months, I think that's a little bit difficult. Now, the other thing you could do is if they're seeing oncology, you can document that. You can say they saw my partners in oncology. They had a full assessment today. And we're refilling their prescription. So, But just to document that somebody's involved, that the, the patients and the families aren't getting six months of 500 MMEs a day and no one's laying hands on them, looking at them, seeing them on telehealth. 
So that is just a recommendation. It's not a law. It's just one of these things to try to keep ourselves aligned in best practices, to have some regular documentation of follow-up. Even if they're being seen at home by the hospice nurse, just documenting that in your chart, the patient was assessed by the RN from hospice and I refilled their medication. You know, those types of things. So you're, you're proving that you're doing your due diligence. Um, and then exit strategies don't necessarily apply in hospice, right? They, they have an exit strategy, and that was the last talk. <laughs> um, so the exit strategy is, is they hopefully have their spiritual life um, come to terms, and, and they've mended some relationships, and, and they're ready for their, for their next path. Um, so here's the so the rule for checking the PMP for all comers says upon a prescription of an opioid or a benzo that you have to check the PMP and then every 90 days if that prescription is continued it says refilled but we all know that actually controlled substances don't actually get refilled necessarily they get a new prescription with a new prescription number every time um, but if every 90 days if they're on the same prescription there's this little exemption in there for hospice and palliative care that I thought was interesting and so paragraph A talks about um, they had to carve out specifically if people are in a a supervised setting like a hospital or a nursing home or they're in a surgical center that if you're directly administering the medications to the patient and watching them you don't have to check the PMP so they carve that out directly orders are administered and then they wrote almost the same paragraph the two paragraphs mirror each other but interestingly in paragraph B the word prescribed was inserted so directly orders prescribes or administers so then that kind of changes the sense of this um, if they're at pain in the end of life or hospice, you're allowed to skip that check. So by law, you don't have to check the PMP, and that's to not limit access to care and medications to people, although checking the PMP is pretty easy, um, that you can just go ahead and get those medicines for people at the end of life or hospice. If people are not clearly at the end of life and you don't have this robust relationship that they're definitely in hospice care, then the best practice is to check the PMP. And I think when this came out in 2016 and 2017, I think Jim was still at Eastern Maine in Cosmina, they, their service did a really good job of documenting that they were doing that. You know, for every patient that the palliative care service, we saw, we checked the PMP and we, you know, paid attention and there were no concerning findings or whatever. And they put that in all their patient charts. So in general, checking the PMP is good, but you do have this end of life hospice exemption if, if you need it. And so that money is the water because the computer system can only see yes, no, did you check, did you not check? And so if you ever get a letter uh, that says you didn't check enough, you can be like, but wait, that was an end of life situation and I didn't have to check. But the computer only says yes and no. It doesn't have all these whatever, if they had an exemption, did they not have an exemption? Were they at end of, end of life? We, we can't see that in our numbers. So that's just my little disclaimer there. Um, and then you have the CDC opioid prescribing guidelines that all these laws in Maine were, were formed on. And the very first sentence says, this is for primary care clinicians, so that's interesting, who are prescribing opioids for chronic pain outside of active cancer treatment, palliative care, and end of life care. So that's basically not you. And there was a follow-up article in 2019 about the misapplication of the guidelines, that people were making policies based on the guidelines for the wrong patients. And the intent is not to limit treatments of pain and suffering, particularly in patients with active cancer, end of life, hospice, all of those situations. But in some instances, some of that was creeping over. And so the guidelines are, are very clear about that. It's interesting when you talk about gray areas, though. I admitted a patient one night who was on high-dose chronic pain medications. It just so happened his prescribing provider had a consent decree from the board about opioid prescribing, so I thought that was interesting. But he'd had active cancer four years earlier, and he had no evidence of current disease, and he was being treated with high-dose pain medications that he had been on prior to his cancer diagnosis under the active cancer exemption. And I looked at that and I'm like, I don't know. I don't think that passes the straight face test. He's had no evidence of active disease for four years. This is a prescription that he was on before his cancer. It's being continued by someone who's already maybe not following all the guidelines and they need to be careful. 
So, but there's gray areas, right? Do people have persistent pain after neuropathies, after chemotherapy? They can. And so that's all that gray area. Um, so, so then uh, the thing is, the, what's chronic pain and what's palliative care? And no one knows the answer to that. There is no right answer. So the law says that palliative care is a, a medical illness or an injury or a condition that affects patients' quality of life. Well, that's everyone with chronic pain. <laughs> so the, the law doesn't necessarily help us. I, I'm glad that Cosmina is here because she came and talked to our group a couple months ago at a staff meeting. And she talked about the definition. And I like her definition of palliative care much better than what the law says, which is a um, serious life-limiting illness. That's the kind of definition she wanted our hospitalists to think about palliative care as someone having a, a life-limiting illness as opposed to it affects their quality of life. Because uh, a 17-year-old who has a back injury after a car accident if they have chronic pain, it affects their quality of life, but they could very well end up living to 87, and should they be on 300 MMEs a day for 70 years, that might not be beneficial to them. We have more and more evidence that that's actually harmful. Increased depression, increased sensitivity to pain, all of those things. Um, and, and then uh, we also have this thing with the palliative care exemption, which was created to be pretty broad so that a lot of people could fall into that so people wouldn't be abruptly denied the pain medication they'd been giving for 15 years. And it's called the palliative care exemption, and it's really broad, but not necessarily everyone who gets the palliative care exemption may meet your definition of palliative care. It's the only thing that people can claim to continue on high dose medicines for a long time. And while our prescribing has come down, we're still at double the rate of the 1990s nationally. So when I hear arguments, people are being denied pain medication, maybe that's true in certain situations, but overall we're still prescribing double the opioids that we were 20-ish years ago. And so there's twice as many opioids in our communities now than there were then. So, um, and, and so that's just a question I have no answer for, this palliative care exemption, which I don't know, is it code C? I only know code D, which is opioid use disorder treatment, because I put code D on all my prescriptions. That's, that's the only code I know. B is palliative care? B is palliative care. Um, so, so what are we looking at in the PDMP? PMP, PDMP, it depends what state you live in. Um, MME is over 100. Interestingly, our vendor only tells us over 90 or over 120. We don't have an over 100 because our vendor is national and we get what they give us. Um, so that's an interesting challenge for us in Maine because we said 100 is our limit, but our vendor doesn't give us that data point. Um, we look at opioid and benzo combinations, which may be all of your patients. So, and, and then for proceduralists, I like calling them that. Proceduralists, surgeons, um, the numbers of people that they're prescribing opioids to. And for instance, in one of our subsections, we found a proceduralist who is prescribing to twice as many patients as the next person down in terms of the number of opioids. So the numbers are in the hundreds. So one person's prescribing to 500 patients and the next person down is 250. And, and so um, maybe that person works 80 hours a week, maybe, or maybe they haven't read the guidelines for their specialty that they should be slowing things down. Lauren wanted to say something. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I forgot. Like, I, I MME, morphine milligram equivalents a day. It's a standardized measurement of how much opioids someone is getting in a prescription. And so there's these calculators. It's in the PMP. When you're prescribing opioids to someone, that's where the state has set the limit to look at things. And so um, if you're on 100 milligrams of morphine a day, if you're on 99 a day, you're below it, right? But if you're on 100 milligrams of morphine a day, you're above it. Oxycodone is uh, about 30% more potent. So like 60-ish milligrams of oxycodone a day would be about 100, those types of things. But there are calculators for it. It's just a measurement of how much opioids someone's taking. And there's not uncommon for someone with advanced cancer to be taking very, very high doses and, and uh, very common and understandable. Um, proceduralists, uh, and so the far right of the curve. So what we did when we first started looking at it is we looked at all comers um, and we looked at some of these things that were easy to measure. And um, we quickly realized that 
uh, all comers isn't a good way to look at things. And so now we've divided people up into buckets. So you'll be happy to know that you're in the hospice and palliative care bucket, and you're there with oncologists and um, a couple of other specialty designations of people um, who might be prescribing for a lot of patients with cancer, hospice, end of life. So that's your bucket. Um, so your, your bucket is good. And now you're not in the all comers bucket and you're not being compared to the orthopedic surgeons. Um, interestingly, some of the guidelines say that orthopedic surgeons, um, they have recommendations now for this surgery, you should get this many pills. Um, it's that concrete. And orthopedic surgeons actually on those recommendations are allowed to give a few more pills than other people. They've been saying all along their stuff is more painful. Uh, we have a resource at MICUS, which is a, a, a program of the Maine Medical Association, and it's just a checklist of all these uh, universal precaution things. Um, and so now on the PMP, we did put an MME calculator on there, um, so that's there if you need to use it right on our homepage. And then this is the menu for you have to be a prescriber or a delegate to a prescriber to look at this. But this is the menu, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Rx Search data and user profile in terms of, but I'm going to go faster. The biggest thing about user profile is you want to make sure that your specialty in the PMP says hospice and palliative care if that's what you're doing most of the time. So if you still say family medicine and not hospice and palliative care, you want to go in and switch it. It doesn't matter if you're board certified or not. And, and for nurse practitioners and PAs, we want everyone to have in there a label that aligns with what they're doing. And we've noticed that several hundred nurse practitioners and PAs say user type, nurse practitioner, specialty, nurse practitioner. That's not so helpful because it just puts you in a big lump. But if you're user type nurse practitioner and the majority of your clinical work is hospice and palliative care, then you should write hospice and palliative care. And you can see for me, it says family medicine, addiction medicine, which only comes through as addiction medicine. I don't know why. Um, so you want to have your specialty right, so you're in the right bucket. Um, and then you want to make sure if you have a delegate um, that they're assigning their checks to you. So in my office, a medical assistant pulls all the charts a couple days before the visit. Uh, she has to be sure that she's not pulling them under my partner's name. She has to check them under my name, because in this day and age of electronics, six years into it, the only way you get credit is if you check yourself or your delegate checks with your name on it. That's the only way you get credit now. Way back when, six years ago, we were like, if you print it out and if your partner checks it and blah, 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 it's all OK. Well, six years later, now everything is electronic. You get credit for checking it under your name. I'm going to go. So this, that's the idea of mandatory use, that you must check the PMP in certain situations. And it's never wrong to overcheck it. In my clinic, we see people every week because they're struggling in their recovery. We check every patient every time. And when my nurse practitioner partner was out the last time I worked, because her kid had a fever of 104, um, I had to see her patients too and write all of her scripts. The MA had to go back and repull all the PMPs under my name. But they were really good about it, and they understood why it's important. So they did. They pulled them all under my name. Um, so here's my score. I got a 93%. Um, so this is a new module. I'll tell you it has one little bug, but you can now check what, what's your score, what's your grade. And I was like, 93, pretty good, but it's not perfect. So, um, so I dug into it a little bit, and so we, we found a bug in this. But I would say if your score is 90 or 93, then you're probably good, right? There might be a little bug in the system, not a big deal. If your score is zero, and you think it should be 100%, that zero of your controlled substances are getting credit for checks, then you might want to check your workflow. So that's a thing you can do to kind of, I don't want to say keep yourself safe, to show that you're trying to do the best you can with best practices. Um, so when you look in mandatory use, you can go down and on the left where it's blank, those are all the patient names and patient birth dates. You can just see the last digit of their birth date. I can find the one patient that caused me to get a 93 and not a 100. And when I clicked on his name, I could go down the bottom and it showed me what was the prescription, the date it was filled and what it was for. So then I could do a little digging. You don't have to do that if you have a 93. You're good. But I wanted to know why I didn't have a 100. So. <laughs> So we looked, and I could see for this patient, my delegate checked under my name two days before the visit because she was doing pre-visit pre planning, and everything looked good. It turned out my delegate spelled the first name of the patient one letter wrong. So like, my name is Elizabeth with an S. If someone had put in Elizabeth with a Z with my birth date, they'd probably get a hit. 
because the computer's smart and it knows, oh, Elizabeth with an S, Elizabeth with a Z, my birth date, yep, yeah, it's probably the same patient. And they'd say, do you want this patient? You say yes. Uh, but because she spelled the first name one letter wrong, I didn't get credit. So that's a little bug in the system that we're fixing. So don't worry if you get a 93, because there's a little bug in the system. <laughs> so this whole mandatory use thing, we called it a soft launch. It's been available in the PMP for a month. Only one prescriber has noticed and complained about their score so far. So we're good. We, we're going to make a big announcement once we fix the bug. Um, but basically, if you uh, search under a misspelled name, hyphenated names, oh my gosh, the bane of your existence if you do data. Hyphenated names are difficult. Um, and there's a way to search with three letters to get a patient. That won't give you credit either. We're trying to fix it. We are. Um, and when we uh, launch it, if you're a prescriber, you'll get an email notification from the PMP. Hey, you can check your mandatory use now. Um, you can now, but we're just not telling anyone because we don't want to get 100 phone calls. Um, so it's a chance to check your workflows. If you're showing up at 0%, then you've got to figure out where, where's the ball falling. If you're showing up 90%, you're good. OK, keep going. Um, I'm just going to talk about patient alerts. You probably get these hundreds of these, right? If someone's over 100 MMEs or someone's on an opioid or a benzo, you get an alert every time. I assume all of you who are prescribers in here get hundreds of alerts. And it's just the way the system is. And I'm sorry you get a lot of alerts, but you're probably numb to those alerts. Um, there's not a way for the system to know which patient is getting this, so it sends out alerts for everyone. So you can see some of mine I didn't even open because I got so many MME alerts back in 2017. I was like, yep, I know that. Yep, I, I didn't even open the alert. Um, here's a new alert that won't show up. It won't come to you as a prescriber, but if you look up the patient, now we have a marker in there that says if the patient has passed. And unfortunately, you've probably heard of this in palliative care, uh, there are family members who continue to fill high-dose opioid and benzodiazepine prescriptions after someone has passed. So to try to cut down on getting refills for someone who has passed, there's now going to be an alert. You'll only see it if you look up the patient. So if you're the prescriber and you're checking, you'll see an alert that the, the patient has passed. If the pharmacist happens to look them up, then they would see the alert. It's not going to show up in your desktop. Um, for you in palliative care and hospice, that would give you a lot of alerts, too, because um, uh, many of your patients pass. But this is where you're going to see it. You can see our test patient. His name is Hans Solo. He sadly died from a patricide with a lightsaber. Um, and, and that's where you'll see it in the report that, that he has passed. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about before I turn things over to Jim is um, as this pendulum swings, um, there are instances, and we've had examples of this in the state of Maine, where people suddenly are unable to prescribe. And more and more patients on high amounts of chronic substances have been um, condensed into less and less prescribers. And so if someone retires suddenly, that happened in Lewiston to a pain practice a couple years ago. 12,000 patients on opioids got sent back to the community primary care. Um, if someone has a licensing action, unfortunately, um, if someone has a disabil disability or death and they're not in a big practice with partners, we're having these examples now of patients can't find anyone who will even accept them as a patient because of the medications they're taking. And so the federal CDC now has a program. This is like a disaster response planning. You know, if you have 100 chronic pain patients and for whatever reason you're in solo practice and you have an accident and, and you're out and you can't take care of What are those 100 people going to do? There's nowhere for them to go. And a lot of people will not take them. So it's almost like uh, people can't access care. And we know that people should not be abruptly taken off of high-dose opioids. They're, they have an increased risk of suicide and, and drug use and overdose that people need to have continuing care. So we're trying to work with the federal CDC in this program to try to get back to the point where primary care is willing to take some of these patients. And we respect the idea of compassion tapering over a long term. That's a great goal for many patients. But if you have an office that says they won't take a single new patient who takes a controlled substance, that's a problem. So we're trying to work to set this up in advance. Um, so that's, that's the kind of, so that's the last thing. There's some resources. And then, I don't know how to use Mac, so Jim, I don't know how to get your slides up. Do you know how to use Macs? Um, try. 
Any questions or comments for Elizabeth while we're getting switched over? I'm blowing any potential COVID. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, right here. I don't have a mask on. I was just wondering if you have, um, I know you've had experience with this. If you have a patient, could be a hospice patient, could be a palliative care patient, I used to be a primary care provider as well, um, that you do suspect that the family is possibly, you ask the patient every time, no, I don't have any pain. You, then you go into the question of, well, how, you know, what, how much pain medicine are you taking? Like, just give me an idea. And they don't, oh, no, I take one oxycodone a day. That's it. But you're getting these requests for a lot of refills. What exactly is the best thing to do in those situations? I'll just talk really loud. Oh, that's a tough one, right? We, oh, we can't do that because we're broadcasting. Got it. OK, we're broadcasting, so we got a mic all the time. That's a really tough situation. Um, if you feel like there's one family member who has confided in you some potential problems with other family members and that family member can be the designated person that you make sure that they can get a lockbox, that the other family members who may be of concern don't have the combination of that. It's hard in all these situations of, uh, uh, of potential elder exploitation and uh, you know, I don't have a good answer. I think we, we do the best we can. We document the best we can. We try to keep the patient safe with access to their care. And um, what we do in addiction medicine, when we start hearing red flags, we start increasing the amount. We see them more often. Now, this might not be appropriate for someone with stage four cancer, but in addiction medicine, we see them more often. We check their urine more often. We give them shorter scripts. We just increase the accountability. That might not be the right thing for someone who's largely bed bound. So I'll give it back to you. How about now? There we go. So hi, again, my name is Jim Van Kirk. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's good to be back in Maine. It's good to see so many familiar faces. Um, one of the greatest things, I've been getting so many hugs today, and look at this. I got lipstick. I haven't had that in years. This shirt is not going to be washed. <clears throat> Anyway, so I wanted to start out my section simply by saying that I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Um, I, uh, when I heard about the strike force, um, I, I will tell you, and I've talked with Candace a lot about this and, and Lauren, I have written and rewritten and redone this talk, um, including late last night, I don't know, about eight or nine times because I'm not really sure where to go with this. I'm gonna talk about cases. We're not gonna have a lot of time right now, but we're gonna carry on with them over lunch. So um, I ask any of you that wanna come back, it's gonna be in here. So anybody who wants to grab their lunch and come back in here, we're gonna keep the discussion going um, because we do wanna stay on schedule. Um, I'm very worried for, for all of you in Maine. Um, I have no disclosures. I am still waiting to go to a palliative care talk somewhere where somebody has something that would be. <laughs> really encouraging to me. Um, I put these up. This is CAPC and the World Health Organization's definitions of palliative care. Um, I think it's easy to say a life, uh, it's, it's certainly easier for us if we say a life limiting condition or a life threatening condition, but that's really not what we're all limited to. And I am intentionally choosing three cases that I, people that I worked with um, that I found a real struggle being in that gray zone of, of not really knowing whether I was doing the right thing or not, um, believing that I was. And I've, I've agonized a lot and gone back, and I think I would still do the same thing if I had to go back. 
But when DOJ is bringing a strike force into your state, um, they are not coming to help us all do better providing better care. Elizabeth is doing that, and, and the PMP is doing that, and I urge you to use the PMP. Um, but if somebody comes in with military terminology, um, they're coming in to make a point. And I hearken back to the days when I started practice in Lexington, Virginia in the early 90s, um, and there were the pros, the peer review organizations. Is, is Toby here? So those of you who are old like me remember the pro. And basically the government said, this was all about billing. And they said 4% of the time or 4.5% of the time, physicians, providers are billing inappropriately, are overbilling. And so they set up these regional groups and their purpose was to go and find who was overbilling and find the people. And I was practicing in southwestern Virginia, and we had a very proactive pro. It was set up, there, there were physicians on the panel as well as, as government people. And our pro said, we are going to educate our way out of this. We are going to teach our providers how to be more careful. This was before computerized health systems and coders and all of that stuff. And they were doing conferences, they were going around, they were going to individual practices, medical staff meetings, everything. And the government came in and said, look, we told you, 4.5% of, of billing is over. Why aren't you citing anybody? And they said, we're educating people to be better providers. They said, you are going to cite at least 4.5% of the providers that you audit or you're not doing your job. And a couple more months went by and the providers stood up to them and they were disbanded. And the government said, fine, we'll take over. I know several practices that were, that ended up being cited. And I heard horror stories. You know, um, people coming in, pulling 20 charts, auditing them, saying, okay, on two of these 20 charts, you build incorrectly. Therefore, we're extrapolating 10% to your entire practice. And this is how much you're gonna be fined. And, um, and, and it was a nightmare. When I hear that there is a strike force coming to Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont, um, I don't think that, I would love to be wrong, and I hope that I hear only stories of how everybody's being supported, but I don't think they're coming in to tell you, oh, you're doing a good job. And Elizabeth, I hope you're right that a 93% isn't something to worry about, but if everybody's scoring a 93 to 100%, the 93% will be something to worry about. And, and I'm, it's the first time I've been happy that I'm not practicing in Maine anymore, I gotta tell you. Um, so anyway, let's talk about palliative medicine. Um, I wanna go through these cases, I'm gonna present them to you, and I want you to grade me. Um, I want this to be critical. I'm not here anymore, you can say anything you want to about me. <laughs> Um, but I really like, um, I'd like people to throw out, gee, why didn't you do this? Or, oh my gosh, you shouldn't really have done that. So my first case is, and, and this one I don't think we're going to have much to discuss. Um, he was a 64-year-old Vietnam veteran um, when I met him. Long history of severe Crohn's disease. Crohn's is not something we typically consider a terminal illness. But can it be? I would argue that it can in certain situations. He also um, had been an alcohol abuser, also had used marijuana, and I put marijuana abuse, but is it um, anymore, or is that still the stigma that we're caught up with from the 60s and 70s? Um, so I don't know. We called it marijuana abuse at the time. Um, now it's legal to use in Maine, so. And he also had bad COPD, was a continuous smoker. He had short gut syndrome, he had severe malnutrition, um, malabsorption, was not willing to consider TPN, and he had been on Oxycontin and Oxycodone. Oxycontin. Those of you who know me know it's my least favorite opioid. I hate Oxycontin. Um, you, you know the stories about the Sacklers and everything that happened, and Maine was certainly one of the, the states that was targeted big time. Um, to push this medication. Um, so what happened? Um, he was seeing his PCP. He was getting Oxycontin and Oxycodone. The practice that he attended um, decided to make a policy change 
and said, we are no longer going to prescribe opioids, period. As of this date, we will no longer prescribe opioids. I had met the guy once. I'd seen him in our palliative care clinic. Um, again, those of you that know me know how much I love methadone. Um, it's cheap, you gotta be very careful with it, you gotta know how to use it, but it works well. And I always hope that maybe it's going to be diverted and misused less than some of the other opioids. I had tried to convince him that a switch over to methadone was the right thing to do. Um, he got upset at me. I was accusing him of being a druggie because methadone was only for people that went to methadone clinics. And um, it's oftentimes, and, and I still go through these discussions with people in Virginia, um, it's oftentimes really hard to convince people to make the switch. And so he left and had, I said, you know, I'd love to see you back. I'd love to work with you on this. I think I can help you do better. Um, I never saw him again. The practice notified him that they were no longer prescribing opioids as of a certain date. Um, he, I got a, a call from his wife. He put a gun to his head and ended his life. He said he wasn't going back. Um, he wasn't gonna go to the drug clinic and he, which I think was me. Um, the, the, the methadone clinic, and he wasn't going to go back through pain. We do have an opioid problem in this state, but we have to find a way to help people that need help, and we have to find a way to come down gently. And when I hear the word strike force, I understand why that practice said, we're not going to prescribe these medications anymore. We're not going to put our practice, our licenses at risk. Anybody want to comment on that case? That one, I didn't really have an opportunity to do anything. Um, let's move on. Let's get one more in before break. And then the third one, which really for me was the most challenging and is continuing, goes on. We'll talk about it at lunch. So, um, so case two, another Crohn's disease patient. Um, this guy, when I met him, was 58, severe Crohn's. He was a father, a grandfather. He was a state legislator. He was an incredible craftsman. Cosmina's smiling already, she knows him. Um, he was an amazing Civil War buff. He loved to do reenactments. Um, his dream was to return to Gettysburg. I, I don't know how many of you know much about the Civil War, but um, what was the guy's name from? Uh, Joshua, Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain, thank you. Um, I grew up near Gettysburg, and we used to always go over and bike the, ba uh, the battlefield. Joshua Chamberlain at Gettysburg probably turned or, or held that battle which really was the turning point of the Civil War. Joshua Chamberlain and the 53rd Maine? Oh, geez, I got it all wrong, Maine 20th. Incredible in the Battle of Gettysburg. And this guy, he loved to go and go to the Civil War reenactments. He'd had 15 abdominal surgeries when I met him. He had multiple abdominal fistula. He had short gut syndrome. He was using TPN at night, every night. He still would eat some, but most of the things would just come out through his ostomy. Um, he had multiple perianal fistula, and he came to me because his gastroenterologist, who had been prescribing OxyContin for him, um, had told him that he didn't need opioids anymore, that the data was clear, and that he, he was stopping his prescribing. He brought with him a picture of his um, fistulagram. They had done a study where they had injected dye, and his perianal area looked like an aerial picture of the Nile River Delta or the Mississippi. I mean, there were just multiple fistula coming out. And I remember the first time I met him, he said, I don't want to be gross or anything, but what I feel, he couldn't sit. He stood through the first visit. He was unable to sit down. He couldn't go to Augusta for his legislative sessions because he couldn't sit. Um, most of the time he spent lying down. And he said, I feel all the time like somebody took a baseball bat, stuck it in one of those tree grinders, and then put it in me. Horrible pain, horrible pain. He also told me that um, he was desperate, that he didn't know what to do about it, and he was considering suicide. He said, you know, I've got all these guns, and maybe it's just time. I've been through enough. But he, wanted, he, he also wanted to be able to live and do things for his grandchildren and all of that. I gave him the methadone talk and he bought it. He said, I'll try. 
So we saw each other every two to four weeks for a long time, and he actually improved dramatically with methadone. Um, I believe for short acting, I was using um, PRN Dilaudid. I remember several months later, I felt such joy and pride when I volunteered to be doc of the day at Augusta. I don't know if any of you do that. It's through the Maine Medical Association. You go down and and really, it's ceremonial, um, but you're there in the house when they're in session and they introduce you and everybody, yay. Um, <laughs> if anything happens, you're supposed to respond. And um, the days that I did it, nothing ever happened, so I just kind of romped around. But he was there, and he was so excited, and he turned around and went. <laughs> he was happier to see me than my own representative who came by to say hi later. Um, he, so I worked with him for five years through his chronic pain. Um, the last year, roughly, um, he was on a continuous dilated infusion. He was not in, under hospice care. He would have none of that. He made a dollhouse that was about twice the size of this podium for his granddaughter. Um, spectacularly beautiful and detailed. He did a lot with railroad stuff. Um, he brought me Gettysburg books from the Civil War because he knew I was from near there. Um, he made me, he made railroad cars from scratch. I mean, he didn't have, you know, it wasn't like what I did when I was a kid where you go to the model store and you snap it together and paint it. Um, he did this from scratch and he made several of those. Um, I still have them. Um, and so he functioned. Um, I, if any of you have been to the haunted house at Fort Knox, um, he was a regular there with one of his guns. Um, <laughs> and so I got to see this guy living his life, and it was so exciting to see this person who was contemplating ending his life getting to live. Um, he ended up, he did have recurrent episodes of sepsis um, related to his lines, his TPN, and he ended up dying in our ICU. Um, after an episode of sepsis that he wasn't able to recover from. It was not all smooth sailing. He was on high doses. Um, I worried the whole time if somebody reviewed this case, would they consider this a terminal illness? I absolutely thought it was. Um, we did have one episode when he was on the Dilaudid pump. One of his sons, well, what happened is he ran out, his cartridge ran out early. And I was like, whoa. How'd that happen? I don't know, I don't know, it just ran out early. And I mean, we had a heart to heart and it turns out one of his sons had injected a syringe and withdrawn the liquid Dilaudid and taken it. And he knew this and I said, you, you have to report this. And he said, I can't turn my son in. And we had really a long, like almost hour long heart to heart talk. And I told him, I said, you know, that's, I'm sorry, but you have to report this or we cannot continue to prescribe for you. And he did. He turned them in. Um, I don't know what happened. I did talk to the, the police from the town. Um, but we had always been very clear the whole way along that these are the rules, like um, Elizabeth said, these are the rules. We're going to follow the rules to the T. Um, we're going to check everything. We're going to be very careful. Um, so that was my case number two. And I'm going to stop talking. Anybody want to make any comments about that case? Um, was I out of line using the palliative care exemption for his care? No. Nobody wants to disagree with me. Somebody. Let's make it interesting. <laughs> what would have been the alternative? Um, the alternative is I would have said, gee, sorry, you don't have a life-threatening illness and I can't see you or I can't prescribe for you. Um, I think, and Cosmina, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, did anybody within our practice have any angst about my work with him? Because I know he became my kind of personal patient. And I don't, it's okay to say that. I got a, a definite feeling that some of my partners were not happy with my working with him the way I was. Do you want to comment? Are you willing to comment? <laughs> Might be better without. <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay. I'm not. 
I think it was a difficult case for all of us because he was very sick. He was in the hospital a lot. A lot of times we were the ones taking care of him because we were doing more inpatient work than you were doing. So a lot of times there were discussions about what are we going to continue. The issue with his son was an on, a situation that really made it worse in terms of the rest of the team really feeling that we're doing the right thing. I don't think anybody disagreed that he was terminally ill and there were no other choices in that he, like you said, even when he was hospitalized, he continued to work on different things, like he was doing painting by numbers and like amazing things that he was doing. So he was functioning. And that's, that's what we're trying to see, that these patients are able to function on these medications. So, but I would not uh, disagree with you. It was a challenging case for many of us. And all of us, I think, at some point, like you have as well, um, did think about, are we doing the right thing here? Are, are we jeopardizing ourselves? Uh, is this something that we need to maybe change? So. so real quickly, I just want to show <laughs> this I love. Good luck. <laughs> and this, and I, I took this picture in um, Lowe's, and one of the managers came over to see what I was doing. Um, and I wanted to have this kind of as our pain toolbox. And I put this there. It's kind of unjust, but it's sadly, I think, serious um, as well. You know, integrated multidisciplinary pain clinics are wonderful. And I would love, there are a ton of people I would love to refer to these places, except that when I left Maine, we had one in the state, and most of my patients couldn't get there. Um, there are all kinds of alternative treatments. Rob, Dr. Rob Ferguson used to work at the Cancer Center in Bangor. He was in the office next to ours. He was great, a PhD psychologist, and he would do guided imagery and self-hypnosis, and I loved working with Rob, and Rob wasn't really valued by the system, and so Rob left. Um, and is still working for the University of Pittsburgh, doing research and in this big group and doing wonderful things. Um, it's awfully hard. It's easy to say, well, there are all these other things that we need that our patients need to do if they are going to have chronic pain. But if we don't have any other way to help them, what do we do? And um, we can't all be Dr. Michalakis's and do it all. Um, we can't be an interdisciplinary team unto ourselves. Um, but I, I think, um, particularly in rural Maine, in rural Virginia, I'm seeing the same thing. We're set up to fail, and these people are desperate, and um, it becomes really hard to know what is the best way, how, is, how do we best help these people. Jim? Yes. Um, has interventional like nerve blocks been considered with this patient? Yeah, we, try, we, we did try nerve block, and it didn't work. Yeah, I mean, th thank you. That's a great point. And in the, the talk that I do later, we're going to talk thank about that. Thank you so that. much. You know what? I think it's lunchtime. Or no, it's no, time to get to our next breakout time. Our, our breakout time. So I people, just want, come back if you want to talk more. We'll do yeah. the other case at lunchtime. Just let me mention one thing. We didn't mention this at the beginning. So we have six hours of CME sort of embedded into this, this day. And we have the ability to get two and a half credit hours to satisfy the opioid um, licensing requirement. So an hour here, half an hour if you come back for lunch, and then depending on what your breakout session is, you can grab another, another full hour. So, so make sure and think about that, because I, I think sometimes these opioid CMEs are hard to find, but you can get two and a half hours. You need three hours every other year. Right. And Catherine is going to, oh. Before Catherine does whatever Catherine's going to do, um, <clears throat> Jim, I would just like to say, and I'm sure everybody in this room agrees with me, and I'm sorry if it embarrasses you, but there's not a one of us that wouldn't want you as our primary physician or our palliative care physician. We tried it and it made her horribly sick. And she came in the next, you know, a couple days later, like, yeah. And, and we've, we've had this great relationship, this patient and I. Um, she has no qualms about calling me Jim. She has no qualms about telling me when I make a mistake. Um, she's been known to throw things at me on occasion. 
Um, and so she came back in and made it very clear that methadone was a stupid idea. And um, I consented and agreed, and we tried fentanyl patch. And amazingly, we were able to titrate it up. And amazingly, she got tremendous response to fentanyl. Um, I don't remember, I'm, I'm gonna guess that maybe we were around 100 microgram patch, but I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but it wasn't an insignificant dose for a small person. Um, but she started having physical therapy. She was able to stand. They were able to get her a walker. And it was probably after we'd been working together for about six months, she came walking into clinic with her walker, had a little seat on it. And her mom, I will never forget that day. It's the first day that she wasn't carried in. And her mom came in behind her and the tears were just, sorry. The tears were just pouring down her face. And she said, I never thought I'd see my daughter stand again. And now she was walking. Several months later, she was able to get her own apartment with a friend. She is still living independently. Um, this happened four or five years ago, do you remember? Um, so it's been a long time. I don't know who's prescribing for her now, but I'm guessing I've dumped it on my past partners. <laughs> um, but she's functioning. She's independent. She has an ex-hospice nurse that I used to work with who is spending a lot of time with her during the day just to support her and help her. Um, and every couple months I get a card from her. Um, she'll send me a note and um, I'll send something back and it's, it's fun to just stay in contact. But interestingly, I got a card from her two weeks ago from both of them, they both write together. So I get a card from the patient and then the hospice nurse sticks in a, no a note as well. And she knows about what's going on. She, she certainly knows about the opioid issue and about being careful and, and not violating things, but she's also terrified about losing her prescriptions. And in the card, she said, so I'm finally thinking that it's time to go to Tampa because I don't know what I could do if I lost, if, if I lose the ability to get my pain meds. And um, so they are planning a trip to go see Dr. Feldman to be evaluated for spinal surgery. And I haven't seen her in a year and a half um, since I left Maine. And I don't know if her condition has deteriorated, if, if it's appropriate that she should be pursuing surgery now or if she's feeling pressured into this because of the whole opioid situation and fear that she will be in the position of not being treated and go back to lying in bed. And um, her comment was, well, I started out lying in bed and if I have surgery, the worst thing that could happen is that I'll end up lying in bed. And so that really has, um, that was a hard note to receive. I haven't written back to her yet and I need to. Um, but I've been, I, for the time that I was treating her, and again, I don't know if Cosmina has an update uh, from, from the group, but I was using the palliative care exemption um, because I, it's maybe a stretch, but I view spinal stenosis in her situation from having spoken to the world expert on surgery as a potentially life-threatening illness. And we were able to give her function um, but again, I think I would be right in the crosshairs um, of a DOJ reviewer for what I did. Comments, thoughts? Oh, do you need a... Test, test, there you go. I just wanted to say, Jim, that I'll never forget that first phone call I received from her. And we probably talked on the phone for an hour and I just listened to her story. And when I got through, your, your face and your practice was the only one that popped into my mind at the time. And I knew you'd take good care of her. I didn't know how that would play out. 
but I knew you would take good care of her. And I am so pleased. You and I haven't talked about that update in a long time, but I am so pleased to hear that she had maybe five years of quality of life. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like for her to have five more or 10 more, but, um, but it's a tough situation. What are your, th uh, talk to me, Elizabeth. What do you think? Um, did, I, did I stretch it too far? Um, I, I want to be the counterbalance to there's a little bit of doom and gloom over here. <laughs> and it's point, fear, it's fear. Point out, there's been a DEA strike force in Virginia and Kentucky and Ohio and West Virginia since 2018. So I think saying that being in Maine is a scary time we're having some things happen on the law enforcement side that have already been happening in other places for years. So I don't think we all have to run and hide necessarily. And the other thing is, is for better or for worse, uh, there were two doctors that were charged with criminal charges that went to the Supreme Court and their cases were returned to the lower court that they claimed that, that they there was that they didn't know that they were violating any standards. And that claim, at least for the short term, worked. So I don't know. I, I want to be optimistic and think if you're doing your due diligence, you're keeping good records, you're doing good paperwork, that that thing that that things are gonna be okay. I mean, you have to prove a lot to show criminal action. That's a pretty high bar. And I don't know, I mean, I, I do things on the fringe with buprenorphine, and I say, DEA, come and look at me, because you can't prove criminal. I mean, you, you might see some things on the side, like, you know, that I'll prescribe buprenorphine for someone who's leaving the hospital that my partner discharged, but I didn't see them, because my partner can't write that script. Things like that, so. Things that are in the gray area. So I don't know, I just want to be a little more optimistic. And, and if, <laughs> if you're talking about palliative care exemption and life-limiting illness, uh, someone who's got short gut syndrome on TPN has a reduced life expectancy. So there's no argument that someone who has severe advanced disease with complications of that disease doesn't have a reduced life expectancy. And, and this lady too, this, her, her many problems probably reduce her life expectancy too. So I feel like you can make some arguments here. I, I absolutely, and thank you. I, I think this should be a balance back and forth. I, I guess my urge to prescribers is document, 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 and document some more. Um, use the PMP, you know, uh, from way back at the beginning in our practice, um, we didn't, worry about the 90 day exemption, we checked the PMP every time we saw a patient, every time we refilled a prescription. Um, you know, we did random pill counts and urine screens, and if there was something that was a little bit funny, then we'd be doing them a lot more frequently. Um, so I think it's always better to do more than what's asked. But I still, I think you and I had this discussion, you know, we're a small enough population state that we pretty much know what's going on in this state. And I don't think, um, like you said, I, I don't think there are pill mills in Maine. Um, I knew of a couple in Virginia when I got there um, in, in pretty short order. But I just fear that people that have an agenda are going to be coming in and scrutinizing all of the work and, and, and looking, not, not looking for a way to improve anybody, but looking for a way to, to punish. And I think we just, just have to be careful that the mindset of these people is not the mindset of you and the PMP. And um, I urge care. And we do our best and we write things down and we have policies and procedures in place. And if I get a 93%, yeah, there's um, not everyone in the states at 93%. So right now, that's definitely right. not a problem. Um, but if I get a 93%, that I at least have a way to say, we have a process, we have something in place. And um, if we lose providers like Elizabeth Mock, 
it hurts the state and it hurts our patients. And we've already seen practices like the earlier case that I presented. We've seen practices that have said we are not going to prescribe opioids any longer, period. So that, that's and an example of going too far, right? Because they're denying care to people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I understand why they're doing that. They're doing it out of fear. Um, and I loved Can Candace's closing comments last night. You know, we do what's right for the patient because that's what we do, and we have to do what's right for the patient. And I want to read this to you. I have this little app on my phone. Every morning it gives me, like, something that's supposed to encourage me to charge into the day that I read every day. And this just kind of freaked me out this morning when I woke up and I flipped this open, and here's what my phone said to me this morning. Most of our obstacles would melt away if instead of cowering before them, we should make up our minds to walk boldly through them. And I think that's great. Unless it's a hurricane. A lot of people, <laughs> yeah. There have been a lot of people that have boldly walked through things and, and been mowed down for it. And I just want to make sure that providers anywhere, not just in Maine, but that you are very, very careful because we cannot lose good providers. Um, All right. I got a comment here. Having worked with you a day or two. Uh, the, for me, the take home message of what you're saying uh, when I look at this case is that you met the patient where they were at and you intervened to improve her quality of life. She was clearly not going to live a whole lot longer. She can't get up and move. You're, I mean, I didn't go to med school, but I understand you're just a sitting risk for all kinds of infections. Come on, people. Um, <clears throat> so my point, of, my, my point is, is it's almost, I guess I just want to say it's almost painful to hear you urge so much caution, because what I don't want is for people to leave here more anxious about it when you are one of the bravest guys I've ever seen in finding a way to meet a patient's needs in your practice. So don't forget that, James Van Kirk. <laughs> and the heck with the Fed's task force. <laughs> I, I think the other thing to point out is that when we have difficult palliative care cases or people who are not clearly at the end of life, and we're managing for five years, to have some things in place to do standardized screening because they are at risk for an opioid use disorder. Right. And they are at risk to be exploited by family members and to make sure we have things in place that we're using standardized screening, that we're talking about it, that the patient has given informed consent to be on long-term opioid therapy and sees the, the risks and the benefits and to continually talk about alternatives and whether or not they're appropriate in this case. I, I think that's another level, too, um, to just make sure um, if someone is escalating dose, escalating dose, escalating dose, and you do a urine and they don't have the prescribed drug in their urine and you never address it, that's when people get into trouble. Um, and on the flip side, you need to know that certain things get metabolized other things and not, quote, unquote, fire the patient because they had the wrong thing in your urine because you didn't know what the metabolites were and that something showed up as something else, but it's actually a metabolite. So we have to be careful. I, I do think it's unfortunate that um, people are just sort of carte blanche saying, we don't do this uh, because we don't do that for anything else. Oh, I don't prescribe insulin because I've gotten in trouble with that before. Yeah. I've had so much hypoglycemia. So we, we have to be advocates for everyone. Go ahead. Oh, I do. <clears throat> so is there a role for a second opinion to, uh, for you to ask a colleague or a trusted person who would be able to review your work and comment on your approach to the uh, pain management in the situation, as opposed to the patient saying, I want a second opinion? How about you requesting a colleague to review your work? I mean, that's the nice thing of having a group um, and being able to discuss patients. Um, so sure. Um, I, I th well, I don't know that everybody in the state um, has that luxury or option, um, but we see each other's patients all the time, or we did. Jessica? Yeah. The, um, the oh. Chapter 21 rules, so all the boards have rules about prescribing for chronic pain. And I, I think this lady here, even though she's using the palliative care exemption, she has chronic pain. She's not at the end of life. 
So then you need to know the Chapter 21 rules from the board and, and like we said, document, but follow them a little bit. In there, it talks about considering a specialist referral and whatnot, but you've already documented that you talked with a neurosurgeon and her only other option is not a good option. But this idea of second opinions, she hopefully has a primary care provider too, and just connecting with them, I think, could help sort of document some of that chapter 21 stuff. And I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but I think it helps when I write down, like at the beginning of the pandemic, when I was doing stuff that like I had never done before, I wrote in the chart, this is the first month of the pandemic. And I'm doing this to keep the patient alive. <laughs> so just in case someone would forget that in March 2020 and April 2020, the medical world went astray and a lawyer's looking at my chart five years from now and everyone forgets. In April 2020, the standard of care I was following was different than what I did in February 2020, but I wrote down why. And I hope that if I ever get in trouble, that's gonna help me, just in case people forget that April 2020 was rough. Jessica. Yep. Oh, I'm just wondering if, if you could talk about the task force that has been set up to make sure that patients aren't undertreated and that their symptoms are actually being managed. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> so um, I just, you know, big picture, like what, you know, as a society, right, where are the moral priorities, right? Um, I think reducing suffering is a really strong moral priority, and I just wish that you could focus more on that, that the society would allow that to be focused on without this hovering dark fear. So. Which is a great lead into a session that's going to happen in about seven minutes with um, doctors Chessa and Miller uh, talking, uh, which is one I would love to attend, um, about the moral aspect of treating suffering, um, the ethical aspect. So, uh, you know, there's a plug for their session. If you don't have something to do at one o'clock, go. Just a quick question is there. Anything in, either in statute or rules governing this topic that ought to be amended before, you know, to sort of stop whatever bad thing we anticipate may happen or could happen? Anything about the law or, or, or rules that we should change? I don't know the answer to that in general, broadly. Um, I, I think luckily the state director of opioid response spent you, the first Steve. 40 years of his career advocating for physicians and for medical autonomy. And he's now directing the office of the state opioid response. So I find that somewhat reassuring. I hope he continues to direct it for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the PMP goes, there are certain things that we wanna change to make things work better and you know uh, Connecticut has methadone treatment on their PMP is that something we would do in Maine um, where does injectable buprenorphine fall in what about schedule 5 drugs uh, there's there's lots of things that we can think about changing but I don't think anything is really big level um, but here's a plug right I know when Jim was here I remember being at the Maine Medical Association annual meeting and we have this 5k walk and I thought like I was really in shape that year and I was gonna like walk really fast I walked really fast for like a couple hundred yards and then <laughs> then my legs cramped up so bad and then Jim and his whole family like they just come like blowing past me um, but I, I do think it's important to advocate, you know, that whatever your society is, whatever your people are. Oh, this is me as an independent talking on, on no one's bill. Um, you know, at, be a member, be a part of your professional society, whether it's the Nurse Practitioner Association, the PAs. I'm sure there's a society for everyone. Um, but I, I do think that it's helpful to have some collective voices in things and to advocate and to testify when things come up. Some crazy stuff seems to come up in legislation from people who are very well intentioned but maybe not as well informed. Yeah. Elizabeth, could I just ask a point of clarification? Um, will federal investigators be coming into Maine individually? And if so, will they be? Um, educated about palliative care and end-of-life care prescribing. Do you know the answer to that? 
I don't not know a lot of detail about the DEA initiatives. Uh, what I do know is it's, I, I believe, some of the same investigators that have been in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont for a while, and I think they kind of know what's going on, and they're, they're looking for instances of billing fraud. I think that that's what it said in the press release. And so there's another thing where you just, you do a really good job and you try to know your rules, right? I am all for the 2021 new rules about billing on time-based services. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all for that, but I, I thought about them and I try to make sure every time when I bill those 99215s that, uh, that I'm, I'm dotting all my I's and crossing all my T's for my billing too. Um, but but I, I don't know kind of where things are coming from. And I don't know if they just had to give it a name and I, I hope they don't find anything. I hope zero of my colleagues have criminal charges against them. I hope, but I don't know. Let, let me just say, as maybe the only lawyer in the room, think about what you know about law enforcement. You know, they, they, are, they are dealing with the serious perpetrators, uh, people who truly need to be held accountable. They're not going to come look if you if they come looking for you and you can explain what you've been doing. It's going to be over. So I would just hope that you would not panic because there is a strike force, which obviously was established because of the number of people who are dying right. from from overdoses. It's not from what you're doing here. I only wish they hadn't called it strike force. That's what they <clears throat> Couldn't they have called it something? We have one minute left. Ah, we're coming over on this end. Okay, I, um, if somebody else wants to use this minute for the same topic, I will shut up. But otherwise, I want to go back to where we ended before lunch and thank you for um, the psych referral <laughs> plug for pain management and request please, please, people who can refer, know your mental health people who work with pain management because it really helps. I used to do uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and relaxation uh, exercises and it really helped. So know them and refer them, please. I'd like to go back to the first case, which was the man who killed himself. It's been haunting me, and we aren't we aren't talking about it. And I think abuse, uh, substance use disorder is so real. It's opioid addiction is so real, alcohol addiction is so real, but what do we do when folks who have a substance use disorder are struggling physically? How do we treat? I mean, it's just such an interesting, <laughs> what's, whatever the word is to describe something that we want to uh, stop an addiction issue, um, and yet we're not treating somebody who has a substance use disorder because we're afraid. It, it, it just, this doesn't make any sense. And I'm worried about um, some prejudice around this population and the need to be treated. And it worries me. And that case is a really good example of that. Yep. And I don't want to leave here today without honoring um, the difficulty of, of where we are with all of this, but honoring this, this person who saw no other choice for themselves. Yeah. Thank you. So real I, I, quickly, I promised that I'd show this. So that's me in my, in my therapy uh, chair. Um, the sunset is over the Penobscot River north of Old Town. And um, this is now my latest favorite picture. So um, the valley underneath that big peak is where our family farm is located. This is in Shenandoah County. So that, that big peak in the middle, and the ridge that's behind that is the Blue Ridge, where the Skyline Drive is. So anybody who finds themselves down in the Washington, D.C. area, you want to come out and see some, some beauty in another part of the country, um, there you go. Thank you all. Catherine, do you need, where is Catherine? 
you want to announce where the next um, breakouts are.